Hi, I'm Phil Steele. One question that I think comes up more and more often for those of us who still carry big cameras is, do I still need to lug this monster around or can I get by with one of these? And each year that question gets a little harder to answer because each year these get better and better. So in this video, we're going to look at the current state of the arms race between real cameras and smartphones and see if it still makes sense to carry one of these around. Let me start out by acknowledging just how good smartphone cameras have become. In many ways, they now actually provide better results than what you get with a full-size DSLR or mirrorless camera. For example, smartphones produce beautiful, vibrant, sharp, well-lit images straight out of the camera, ready to share, images that would take a lot of post-processing on a computer, even to try to match the quality with your DSLR or mirrorless camera. Many smartphones now do automatic HDR, high dynamic range, by instantly shooting and combining multiple images to capture both the highlights and the shadows. By contrast with most DSLR and mirrorless cameras, this is still a manual process of taking multiple photos and then merging them together in post-production. Smartphone cameras are getting better and better at faking shallow depth of field, something that has traditionally required large lenses with wide apertures. And later in this video, we'll compare some photos to see whether smartphones have caught up with big cameras on depth of field. Smartphones are even beginning to excel in one of the former strongholds of big cameras, low light photography. Through some kind of mathematical wizardry, smartphones are now compensating for their lack of sensor size to produce truly amazing images in low light. We'll look at some examples later. When it comes to shooting video, smartphones are now in many ways superior with excellent stabilization, slow motion, and unmatched portability. They're easier to use on gimbals, and the videos are easier to share. I think for nearly all non-professional purposes, and some professional ones as well, it's now preferable to use a smartphone for video. The only time I still use a big camera for video is like what I'm doing in other parts of this video, where I have my mirrorless camera that I'm talking to locked down on a tripod, and I'm completely controlling all the light in the scene. In other real-life situations with changing lighting conditions or when I'm moving around, I prefer to use a smartphone. When it comes to editing photos, smartphones now have excellent tools available at your fingertips on the phone without having to export your photos to a computer and do the work there. And finally, of course, it goes without saying that smartphones are more convenient and compact to carry. They literally fit in your pocket. So given that smartphones have become so good, is there any reason anymore to own one of these? Well, I think the answer is yes, because there are still some inherent advantages to large lenses and large sensors, advantages based on the laws of physics, that smartphones, despite all their computational brilliance, are going to have a hard time matching. Let's look at some examples. Smartphones have become amazingly good at simulating a shallow depth of field. This used to be the hallmark of professional photography done with big, wide aperture lenses. Now, in the case of smartphones, this is faked. It's done with math, with computation, to blur certain parts of the image after it's taken to give the illusion of a shallow depth of field. Here are a pair of before and after photos from my iPhone using the portrait mode. In portrait mode, the camera takes the original photo, seen on the left, and then it applies some mathematical blurring to it to simulate the shallow depth of field created by a wide aperture. And it actually keeps both of these photos. You may only see the one with the blurring applied when you scroll through the photos in your camera, but if you go into the edit mode, you can turn the blurring on or off to revert to the original. Or if you import the photos into Lightroom, as I did here, you'll discover that there are actually two versions saved, one blurred and one not. And if we look at the blurred portrait mode photo, it looks pretty realistic. It's blurring both the foreground and the background, giving the illusion of a shallow focal plane focused on the subject's face, with the focus falling away in each direction. Very impressive. But now, let's compare it to a similar photo taken with my DSLR. 
First, you'll notice the smartphone photo didn't do such a great job on the skin tone. And of course, it's a mannequin, but still, the DSLR shot looks more realistic. And when we compare the shallow depth of field, the smartphone version starts looking a little heavy-handed by comparison. With the DSLR, the falloff from the focal plane is more smooth and gradual. Look in particular here at the edge of the hair, where on the DSLR we can see individual hairs in focus, but the smartphone photo kind of took a hammer to everything outside the focal plane and just blurred it out. It doesn't look quite as natural. You can see that problem even more in this close-up shot of some little flowers on this budding plant. In the DSLR photo on the left, you see a natural and smooth progression of the blur, gradually increasing as you get away from the focal plane. But in the smartphone simulation on the right, done in portrait mode, the phone has a hard time knowing exactly what to blur. This happens because it's having to guess at the distance of objects from the lens and then blur things according to that guess. And it ends up looking a little wonky sometimes, with areas blurred that look like they should be at the same focal distance as other areas that are sharp. It just doesn't look quite as natural. Finally, let's look at a low light example, where we're looking at the bokeh, the background blur of the lights behind the subject. Now here I was trying to illustrate this at home using the lights on a Christmas tree. Here's a better example of the bokeh effect that I'm trying to create here. This is a photo from my off-camera flash portrait course using a DSLR with a wide lens, and you can see how you can really create gorgeous background bokeh using the lights behind the subject. And here's another example from that same course. If you want to see how you can take these kinds of photos at night with just your camera and flash, check out my advanced off-camera flash course at steeltraining.com. So anyway, here was my half-baked attempt to demonstrate this at home with the iPhone. And I had a real problem with my iPhone because in portrait mode, it would not let me zoom in or use a telephoto lens. I could only use the standard lens at the standard focal length when I was in portrait mode. So I had to choose between having my subject look nicely proportioned, as you see here in this photo, where I zoomed in when I was not in portrait mode, or I could have my subject distorted at a wide angle when I'm using portrait mode, as you see here, to get the background blur. And even here, in the best shot that I was able to get of the background blur in those lights, you can see the quality of the fake background blur. While it's very good, it's not quite as nice as the real bokeh created with a wide aperture lens on the DSLR. One area where smartphones still come up short compared to the full-size DSLR or mirrorless cameras is in resolution. And this only makes sense. The smartphone sensor is a tiny little thing compared to the big sensor you can get in a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And the laws of physics still matter. There's only so much light that can fall on that tiny little smartphone sensor. It just can't collect as much data as the big sensor in a full-size camera. And there's no getting around that. Compare these two photos that I shot recently from the deck of my house. Look at the resolution on my 10-year-old Canon 5D Mark III DSLR compared to my brand new iPhone on the right. Even this old DSLR with its low resolution by today's standards beats the pants off the much newer iPhone. One surprising place that smartphones seem to be catching up to big cameras is in low-light photography. Compare this blue hour photo from my iPhone with a similar one from my DSLR. Even with its much larger sensor, the DSLR had a hard time capturing the full dynamic range of light and shadow that the iPhone managed to get, and the iPhone allowed me to shoot this handheld while the DSLR shot had to be done on a tripod. Now, of course, I can take the DSLR photo into Lightroom and bring up the shadows to try to balance it out. But you can see how the iPhone, right in the camera, managed to get the interior lights of the house exposed and simultaneously capture details in the shadow areas outside the house. Now what I think the iPhone is doing here is automatically taking several different photos at different exposures and merging them together into one HDR, high dynamic range photo, to get that full range of light and shadow. Now to do that on the DSLR, I would have to manually take several different photos at different exposures and then merge them together in post-production. But the iPhone just did it automatically, all on its own, in camera, handheld, which is amazing.
But of course, if you zoom in on the details, you'll see that the DSLR still has more resolution, which only makes sense given its bigger sensor. So I think you can see why I still consider it indispensable if you're a serious photographer to have a real camera, whether it's a DSLR or a mirrorless. As amazing as the technology in these smartphone cameras has become, and it truly is amazing, it's still limited by the laws of physics, still limited by that tiny sensor and tiny lens. However, I think we've all learned at this point not to underestimate what's possible with sheer computing power. And now, especially with AI taking off, I expect the smartphone simulations of these physical properties to keep getting better and better. On the other hand, the big camera makers are not going to stand still. They're going to keep improving these cameras as well while adding more intelligence to them. And they are always inherently going to have the laws of physics on their side. So for the foreseeable future, I think any serious photographer is still going to want one of these. I hope you found this helpful. I look forward to talking to you again soon. If you like my videos, you can find many more, including videos that you won't find on YouTube, plus all of my full-length photography courses and my courses on Lightroom and Photoshop, all on my website at steeltraining.com.